Okay, good morning everybody. My name is JP Tasker and I'm from CBC News and I'll be today's moderator. We have before us here today MP Ryan Turnbull, MP Elizabeth May, MP Taylor Backrack, MP Jean Denis Guerron, Senator Rosa Galvez, and Julie Siegel or Segal from uh, Environmental Defense. They're here to talk to us about uh, climate aligned finance. So please, you have the floor. Thank you. Well, good morning, and uh, what a great morning it is. Uh, I've had many, many thoughts from the stimulating discussions this morning. And I'd like to thank the panelists and keynote speakers, and particularly Senator Galvez, for organizing the breakfast this morning. That uh, we had some very thoughtful remarks and contributions from very prominent speakers, uh, including Catherine McKenna. Uh, it's never been more clear to me we need and we have leadership. Our government has been demonstrating leadership on climate action, has, has put forth the most comprehensive climate action plan in Canadian history and backed it up with historic investments. We've implemented a price on pollution, putting more money back in people's pockets. We've enshrined Canada's commitments to net zero into law and binding all future governments. We've launched programs like the Net Zero Accelerator, the Strategic Innovation Fund, the Low Carbon Economy Fund, the Critical Minerals Strategy, the Clean Fuels Fund, Canada Infrastructure Program, the Canada Innovation Corporation and the Canada Infrastructure Bank and more. Investments totaling well over $120 billion and over 100 climate action measures. We know these actions are having an impact. Just a few days ago we had good news in the 2023 National Inventory Report. Canada's 2021 emissions profile was 53 megatons smaller than it was in 2019. That's equivalent to taking 11 million cars off the road. This places Canada's performance as a leader or the leader in the G7. And I think it's important to say this because that's significant progress and it should not go unrecognized. That's not to say that we shouldn't do more. We have to do more. Uh, I think Canadians are relying on us to increase our ambition and to continue to act. Budget 2023 acknowledges that we must do more and leverage the power of the markets. We've uh, put in that budget a tax credit regime, which is very large and competitive, probably competes quite comprehensively with the United States and the Inflation Reduction Act, and will attract private investment into the green investments that we need. We've also uh, put in the budget blended finance utilities such as the Canada Growth Fund and reprofiled the Canada Infrastructure Bank. And those are significant signs and signals uh, of a marketplace that is changing and that uh, we, where we can enable uh, and attract private investment into the areas that are needed. So now more than ever, we must work together to chart a path forward and take the next big step in the fight against climate change, which is to align the financial system with our net zero commitments. What you see here today is a swell of political will and growing momentum uh, aligning our financial system uh, that combines four political parties from the House of Commons, the Liberals, the Bloc, the NDP and the Green Party are all represented here today. We have Senator Galvez leading with her Climate Aligned Finance Act in the Senate uh, and we have civil society here as well with environmental defense being represented. I want to say thank you to my colleagues at, for being here today and supporting Motion 84 which I tabled in the House of Commons which, um, you know, we've had 12 seconders so far and I hope we'll have more. Um, it's the start of a highly collaborative effort to work across industries with market actors, including our financial institutions as partners with a view to achieve the economic prosperity and environmental sustainability that we owe future generations. We know we must marshal the resources necessary to fill the $120 billion a year investment gap and ensure that capital flows into the investments needed for Canada to get to net zero. It will not happen on its own. We have to work together and incorporate the best climate science with our smartest and brightest 
leaders across our financial industry, and we must harness and scale the solutions and innovations that we have here in Canada and create the enabling conditions for this to happen. This means managing climate risk more effectively, but also, and more importantly, ensuring that capital is allocated adequately for a whole of economy approach that rapidly and responsibly decarbonizes and stays on that trajectory to net zero. If we don't align our financial system, we will not get there. What's at stake is the stability of our financial system, the growth of our economy, sustainable jobs and careers for generations of workers, the cost of living, the preservation of nature in all its beauty, its ecosystems, its biodiversity, and ultimately the habitability of our planet. With a record number of wildfires burning right now, we are reminded that Mother Nature is not waiting for us to get our act together and figure out the next steps. We need action, ambition, and urgency. With the damages and losses due to climate change already estimated to reach 25 billion by 2025 and quadruple by mid-century, which jeopardizes GDP growth, no one can deny that our future prosperity is jeopardized by not acting swiftly. There is no upside to waiting on implementing a climate-aligned financial system, and yet we must move together and we must do it responsibly. Motion 84 is purposely non-prescriptive and does not specify legislative or regulatory tools which will need to be used and brought into force. Those discussions have begun and are underway as of this morning, but have actually probably already been going on for quite some time. As uh, I would note, uh, I organized a sustainable finance forum, which was two days with uh, over 60 speakers and 200 participants across the House of Commons. That was just uh, the, the last fall. So uh, we must do this for the good of the planet and the good of our economy. And what I know is that we can't be attached to exactly how it's going to look. I think we all have to participate in an open discussion and figure out the path forward. This way we leave room for productive conversations and finding our way uh, together, which is so important. As someone who spent my whole career uh, in helping build a more sustainable economy and who just last fall hosted that sustainable finance forum, I can tell you uh, this. My goal is to work together to as rapidly and as responsibly as possible design and implement the legislative and regulato regulatory framework that creates the enabling conditions for markets to shift and capital to flow into the investments that can drive growth and prosperity while rapidly decarbonizing and getting to net zero. All this for the good of our economy and the good of our planet. Thank you. Is there another speaker or is that, uh, yeah, okay, go ahead. Thank you. So first I want to uh, express my deepest gratitude to all of you, all of these groups, party caucus that are supporting us moving into with the climate finance and um, sustainable um, development in general. Um, I want to thank uh, MP Turnbull for his leadership and I, thank all the MPs that have co-signed and uh, supported the motion. You know, while it is increasingly evident that our financial system um, is passively suffering from increasing climate risk, we have yet to tackle how it is contributing actively to the climate crisis by financing and facilitating emissions from fossil fuels causing this planetary warming. The science is clear. The solutions are there. Uh, we have hope that our financial institutions will rise to the climate challenge, but we know that hope is not a strategy. World-leading Canadian legislation is. We have heard from our panelists that regulations is, are necessary because we have to give clear signals to the, to the finance world. So S243, the Climate Aligned Finance Act, CAFA for short is a comprehensive set of legislative change to align the financial sector with climate commitments and set us on an ambitious path to climate safe future, not only for our generations but for next generations to come and to help addressing reconciliation. 
It was drafted, CAFA was drafted in consultation with dozens of international and national experts. And rather than being a set of best practice, the bill humbly is a collection of the best ideas from across the world adapted to the Canadian legal landscape. We gather some of the best minds and propose a framework that, take from, that can take Canada from international lager to a leader. These measures include enforcing science-based targets and holding financial institutions accountable to them, establishing climate alignment as a superseding duty, which is the cornerstone of our intergenerational duty to our kids, grandkids, and future generations, and strengthening capital adequacy requir requirement. We just heard that there is actually not very complicated to see if we are doing progress. Emissions must go down and cash flows capital must go in the right direction of clean tech. So we can have a low carbon economy, a knowledge economy, a well-being economy. Taken together, these measures will result in greater climate resilience across our whole financial ecosystem. So thank you again to all my colleagues from Parliament and from all um, lines of, of, of politics. And uh, I hope that um, many more will join uh, Motion 84. Thank you. Okay, next. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. I, I'm pleased to be here on behalf of the NDP and to express my support both, both for Senator Galvez's bill, uh, the Climate Aligned Finance Act, and for MP Turnbull's motion, which uh, are part of this move to align our financial system with the imperative of climate action. We know that voluntary approaches aren't working. Uh, we can't uh, simply encourage these institutions to do the right thing. We need to require it, and I think that's very much the spirit of Senator Galvez's bill, which uh, changes the rules that our financial system operates by. Uh, we need an all-hands-on-deck approach, and of course the financial system is one of the most powerful tools that we have. I, I ride a bicycle to, to work every day on the hill, and I was thinking about metaphors for how to describe the situation we're currently in. Uh, right now it feels like when we have uh, the biggest financial institutions in our country investing in the very activities that are worsening the problem, it feels like we're trying to ride our bike with the brakes stuck on. Uh, the financial system, by contrast, can be a tailwind if we reset the rules and we um, ensure uh, real accountability for, for the sector. Um, I, I'll take a little bit of a, a, a different approach to my colleague uh, MP Turnbull, um, who, who expressed that we can't be too attached to how this thing looks. Uh, I think that Senator Galvez's bill, uh, because there has been so much thought that's gone into it, because it reflects uh, really some of the, the strongest thinking on how we reform our financial system. Uh, we know that time is of the essence, and because all this work has been done, because it's been articulated in legislation, it's imperative now that we move it through the legislative process as quickly as possible. And it's wonderful to see uh, all of the, uh, the four parties uh, lined up here on the stage today showing support for the overall direction of this initiative. I'm really pleased that it's something that the NDP has got behind. And I'll add one more thought, which is that this isn't only about aligning the power of the financial system behind our, our climate ambition as a country. It's also about protecting the ordinary Canadians who are invested in pension funds, um, who uh, stand to bear a lot of the risk if these institutions continue to invest in activities that aren't part of the transition that we know is so important. So thank you very much for, for coming today and thank you to my colleagues for being part of this initiative. Bonjour tout le monde, merci d'être là. Euh, D'abord, merci à mon collègue, M. Turnbull, d'avoir déposé la motion et euh, mes hommages à, à la sénatrice Galvez. Euh, je l'ai dit euh, à plusieurs reprises, c'est un projet de loi euh, dont plusieurs d'entre nous auraient aimé être l'auteur. Euh, et on a vu la sénatrice Galvez, au cours des euh, derniers mois, euh, consulter, rencontrer euh, avec des experts, avec des scientifiques. Et euh, évidemment, le, 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 la quantité euh, d'input scientifique qu'on retrouve derrière ce projet de loi-là est impressionnant. Est impressionnant. Alors, merci sénatrice, euh, merci à l'ensemble des collègues. Écoutez, euh, 
Ce que ce projet de loi-là nous rappelle, c'est que les flux de capitaux peuvent être une force redoutable dans l'économie. Et présentement, euh, ils sont trop souvent une force redoutable en faveur du statu quo. Il va nous ils amener beaucoup trop rapidement au-delà des deux degrés. Euh, le, euh, les, les flux de capitaux doivent être redirigés, les incitatifs doivent être alignés de telle façon euh, à ce que... Euh, on a des investissements majeurs vers la transition à l'énergie verte. Et il faut toujours se rappeler que ce sont des opportunités d'emploi et de croissance. Et que tant et aussi longtemps que le Canada sera en retard dans ces filières de croissance-là, euh, on perdra des opportunités et arrivera un jour, arrivera un jour où on devra importer ces technologies-là, aller les chercher ailleurs et être dépendant de nos partenaires commerciaux pour les avoir. Euh, alors... Euh, ce que le projet de loi nous rappelle également, c'est l'importance de la transparence, l'importance du secteur privé, l'importance d'avoir des cibles scientifiques, l'importance d'avoir des plans qui sont chiffrés. Et ça nous, rappelle aussi que, euh, ça nous rappelle aussi que la bonne volonté n'est pas une politique publique et que lorsqu'on laisse le secteur privé euh, user de bonne volonté, on manufacture des passagers clandestins en matière de climat. Et parmi ces passagers clandestins-là, on retrouve les banques canadiennes, à premier titre, euh, au premier titre, la RBC. Et on retrouve des compagnies pétrolières, gazières, qui, sous couvert de, euh, qui, sous couvert de des blanchiment de greenwashing, euh, laissent sous-entendre qu'elles agissent. Et ce qui leur permet de faire ça, c'est le fait que d'autres secteurs de l'économie agissent. Alors, euh, je vais conclure en vous disant que, et je pense que c'est évident aujourd'hui, que si... Presque tous les partis présents à la Chambre des communes sont ici aujourd'hui. C'est parce que l'avenir n'est pas partisan. Que l'avenir de nos enfants, des prochaines générations, de nos écosystèmes, de notre planète n'est pas partisan. Et euh, je remercie l'ensemble des collègues d'être ici aujourd'hui. J'espère, j'espère qu'on va pouvoir progresser le plus rapidement euh, avec les prochaines étapes législatives et qu'on aura rapidement le plaisir d'étudier euh, ce projet de loi-là à la Chambre des communes. Et on peut euh, assurer évidemment toute la collaboration du Bloc québécois. Merci pour selon le Parti vert du Canada. Je suis tellement heureuse d'être ici avec mes collègues. Je suis fière de voir le, le, le rôle de quelqu'un avec un, un official seconder de, de la motion de M. Turnbull, le député de Whitby. I disagree with some of, of the characterizations of how well our government is doing, but I don't disagree in one uh, syllable with the urgency with which we need to move ahead with climate financing. Uh, as as, uh, as Jean-Denis just said, um, the Royal Bank of Canada is not just the worst climate enemy in Canada as a bank. It has the worst record in the world of a bank that, that is shoveling money in the furnace of future climate disasters. We, are, we have already baked into our atmosphere decades ahead of extreme weather events due to the climate crisis. What we have to do is meet the targets of ensuring that greenhouse gas levels stop rising before 2025 and fall sharply by 2030. Yet we have an act in the Canada Pension Plan Investment Act that requires that our pension plan dollars go for the highest return on investment without any modifiers about being in the public interest and without any suggestion that they shouldn't go into fossil fuels. Our very pension plans, as every individual Canadian, are unhinged from the climate financing imperative. So yes, we know that uh, we've played a role Individual Canadians have played a role in raising climate finance. I should reference former Governor of the Bank of Canada, former Governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, who was the special envoy for Antonio Guterres, Secretary General of the United Nations, in mobilizing climate finance. It is a hot topic, and it requires action. Je suis, je suis absolument en faveur de le projet loi menant de sénatrice Rosa Galvez, uh, le 243. C'est un euh, projet de loi tellement important et j'espère qu'après le, 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 le Sénat va, j'espère, voter en faveur. Euh, nous sommes prêts, comme députés, de faire l'effort pour, euh, pour un projet de loi qui va marcher. So I'll stop there and say we are united in the goal of getting Canada's uh, role in climate finance 
to meet the task, and it, there's nothing more urgent and nothing more important. Okay, is uh, Ms. Siegel, do you want to say something? Go ahead. The cross-party support for this motion from the Liberals, the NDP, the Bloc, the Greens is truly groundbreaking. Canada finally has an all-star team of firefighters ready to tackle what remains the biggest gap in Canada's climate policy, private finance. The current under-regulation of, Can of Canada's financial system hurts our ability to reduce emissions and create a good and affordable economy. Canadian banks and pension funds are the world's largest investors in fossil fuels, which puts over $100 billion of Canadian assets at risk of becoming obsolete. When it comes to financing clean energy, our banks rank in the bottom third globally, but are leaders on fossil fuel financing. Regulation is the essential solution to mobilize the financial sector for a safe climate and a functioning, more affordable economy. So this motion is very much a Kickstarter. Incentives may encourage things to happen, but regulation and legislation rules make them work in the best interest of Canadians. Without rules, Canada will continue to fall behind on the truly green economy um, with our banks and pension funds investing in an anachronistic fossil fuel economy instead of the future green one. I'm really thrilled to see this motion because I want to see Canadians' hard-earned money protected, I want to see Canada attracting green investments, and I want to see Canada deliver on our global climate commitments to keep warming below 1.5 degrees. Two key words in this motion um, make, it, make it really excellent. First, using all tools at the disposal of the government, and second of all, aligning with the Paris Agreement. Using all tools points to the need for rules to complement the existing incentives. And then the second piece about looking at alignment moves beyond what the financial sector is currently doing of just counting and disclosing emissions. I've used this analogy before, but in a sinking boat, you have to plug the leaking holes, not just count and disclose them. Um, so this federal government leadership with Motion 84 recognizes the need to go beyond just disclosing climate risk and instead requiring emission reduction cuts because otherwise our economy risks, risks capsizing. So every party should support this agenda for climate-aligned finance because it's fighting for the best interest of Canadians, of constituents, and for our climate. Um, thank you to, to Senator Rosa Galvez for your leadership on this issue, to MP Turnbull for your leadership on this issue, and to these excellent members of four parties um, for recognizing the need to align finance with our climate commitments because that is the only way Canada will achieve a safe, a safe climate and safe economy. Um, now that this all-star team has assembled themselves, uh, I encourage you to use the tools at your disposal to hold financial institutions accountable to cutting emissions in half by 2030. Merci bien. Lovely. Thank you so much. So we will now turn to questions. We'll start with questions in the room and then we'll make our way to Zoom. If you're joining us on Zoom, please use the raise hand function now to tell me that you have a question to ask these guests and I will pivot to you after we're done with the questions in the room. Okay. David Thurton, CBC News. One question, one follow-up. It's the first question I just want to ask is, well, first of all, good morning. Um, we're talking about two things here. The motion, uh, Senator, your, your bill that's in the Senate, how will this motion advance the Senator's bill and do all the parties support uh, the, uh, Senator Galvez's bill? Do you want me to Ryan, start? please, yeah. Yeah, so uh, Senator Galvez and I have been uh, talking for quite a while about her bill, so I've reviewed it. Um, I certainly support uh, the bill as is. I think there are aspects of it that may be strengthened through the debates and parliamentary process as it goes. I mean, I think it's a compilation, as Senator Galvez has said eloquently, of uh, some of the best practices around the world. Uh, motion 84 has been tabled in the House of Commons as a signal and a sign uh, to both the government and to other parties that we need to start to have these debates and conversation in preparation for what I hope will be a successful passage through the Senate of Senator Galvez's bill, whereupon we can start our parliamentary work uh, on that bill. Yeah. 
Thank you so much for the question. Yes, it is very important. So um, in the Senate, uh, we can table mem private members' bill, and it goes through a process of uh, first uh, reading, second reading, going to committee. Uh, and uh, I tabled this bill one year ago. So I expect that uh, at a point it has to be sent to committee. Hopefully this will happen very soon, but any help in the direction that the other house is expecting for the bill should put pressure and should tell my colleagues in the Senate that uh, uh, this has the interest uh, of the public and of um, these different caucuses in the other place. And hopefully we'll, we'll, it will go to committee and then it will go to the other place. Okay, and just as a follow-up, I'll just ask, um, and maybe we could throw this out to the other MPs who are here. I see the Greens are here, I see the Bloc Québécois, uh, the NDP, and of course, the governing Liberals. Why are the Conservatives not here? Je pense que la réponse est claire. Chaque journée dans le Parlement, dans les débats, les députés conservateurs sont debout pour dénoncer les petites étapes que le gouvernement libéral a essayé pour uh, réduire le gaz à effet de serre. So we have, unfortunately, I think a partisan divide that should not be there. Many individual conservative members of parliament understand the climate crisis and are very thoughtful. So I regret that whatever talking points in the back rooms of the conservative spin doctors have overtaken any understanding of science. And it's very, very regrettable. I don't want to add anything to that by generally using a broad brush to denounce conservatives. I wouldn't do that. Conservatives around the world, whether it's Nicolas Sarkozy or Margaret Thatcher or Angela Merkel, all around the world, you find strong climate action coming from parties of the right. And I just hope our conservative friends will wake up before they find their children's future has burned up before their eyes. En réponse à votre question, il faut se dire la vérité. Euh, L'éléphant dans la pièce en matière de lutte au changement climatique au Canada, c'est le fait qu'on vit dans un pétro-État, qu'on a les, parmi les plus grandes réserves de pétrole prouvées au monde, qu'on est sur le podium. Et c'est au centre de la plateforme politique du Parti conservateur que de faire en sorte qu'on demeure un pétro-État et qu'on grossisse comme pétro-État. Alors, euh, je pense que euh, dans certaines provinces, on retrouve beaucoup de députés conservateurs ont euh, fait l'erreur de penser que la transition ne peut pas leur être favorable. Et évidemment, euh, on espère, euh, comme a dit ma collègue, on espère que la partisanerie un jour euh, sera mise de côté pour qu'on puisse avancer et être digne d'une démocratie du 21e siècle et non d'une pétromonarchie. OK, merci, M. Gaon. Euh, prochaine question, c'est Cormac McSweeney, City. Il est en Zoom. Go ahead. Can you hear me OK? We can hear you. Go ahead. Excellent. Um, so this is a little bit off topic, but uh, generally the same theme. Um, just wondering if any MPs, but as well, the environmental defense representative could respond to this. Uh, the parliamentary budget officer just released a report on clean fuel regulations, uh, finding that over the next seven years, it could increase the price of gasoline by 17 cents, uh, but also decrease the real DG GDP of Canada uh, by up to $9 billion. Uh, you know, Canadians, uh, driving their cars to work, hear something like that, and they, you know, during an inflation crisis, they may groan and say, Why are we doing this? This is going to cause more problems for the economy and for my pocketbook. How do you respond to that? Um, I, I guess would be my first question, and anybody who wants to respond, go ahead. Cormac, I feel like I'm just going to jump in unless one of my colleagues jumps first. Okay, just, I have great respect for the Parliamentary Budget Office. I have not yet read this report, but I have read all their other reports that relate to climate themes. And the deficiency in their analysis has been a failure to assess the costs of inaction and the increasing costs, both in terms of loss of life. And by the way, I think I would like to refer to heat domes as the neutron bomb 
of climate impacts because it kills the people but leaves the buildings standing. So in four days in British Columbia in summer 2021, when 619 people died, so our worst single climate event in terms of loss of life, registered very little in terms of economic impact because the buildings were left standing. But taking it as a, a noted that Hurricane Fiona, the billions of dollars of damage, the infrastructure damage from atmospheric rivers, the costs of inaction are clear and have a bigger impact on our GDP than marginally small impacts of taking climate action. And, and I'm not critical of the PBO, they always state this up front that their analysis has not included what would happen if uh, and what the economic costs are of the climate crisis we're trying to avert. So that, that's a, a brief comment and I think Canadians, a lot of Canadians understand that inflation isn't some abstract thing. Cost of food goes up when there are extreme droughts and the, and food literally costs more. Yeah, I would uh, second that. I think the, um, uh, what comes to mind for me is the Canadian Climate Institute's recent report called Damage Control, where they look at the cost that climate change is actually having on the Canadian economy and the losses and damages that are drastically increasing and that they've projected them to increase will threaten the very uh, stability and, and the growth of GDP in our country. So by mid-century, they predict that uh, there will be um, uh, losses and damages due to climate change reaching, I think it's about $100 billion, which is roughly 50% of projected GDP growth. So just think about that. Just think about how economic prosperity in Canada would be threatened. So it's it's a little bit um, concerning to pluck one climate policy out of that and do an analysis on it, but not look at the overall cost of, and I think what Ms. May talks about, uh, my good friend and colleague Elizabeth May always makes good points. She uh, She's pointing that there's even more cost if you consider the cost of inaction, because we're really just, you know, even the, the Climate Institute's report is, is really only looking at a portion of the cost. They're really only looking at the, they're not looking at the loss of opportunity. Um, they're looking at just the damages and losses that we, that we can count and know about currently. So I think you have to look at it holistically. Um, and that's why we're calling for a whole of economy approach. We have a whole of government approach and it can be improved. Uh, I think everyone would agree that we can continue to improve it, but it's far better than what we had for a decade under, uh, under the conservative leadership, unfortunately. Si je peux ajouter un, sans quelques mots, c'est qu'il faut bien comprendre le mandat du directeur parlementaire du budget qui est d'énoncer des coûts. Quand, par exemple, on augmente les transferts en santé, le directeur parlementaire du budget nous dit combien ça coûte pas qu'est-ce que ça va avoir comme impact sur la santé des Québécois et des Canadiens. Quand on investit en transfert pour le capital humain, le directeur du parlementaire nous dit combien ça coûte, pas quel effet ça va avoir sur le bien-être au quotidien des gens qui vont bénéficier de ces investissements-là. Alors, euh, le directeur parlementaire, dans un calcul coût-bénéfice d'une politique, nous donne l'élément de coût. Alors, si on, se résume seul, si on se résout à seulement lire cette analyse-là, il n'y aura que des coûts... À, à, inévitablement. Alors, il faut toujours bien comprendre le mandat du directeur parlementaire du budget et complémenter l'analyse avec l'effet que les politiques auront sur le bien-être euh, des Québécois, des Canadiens à long terme. Et je rajouterai qu'au Bloc québécois, et on, je pense qu'on n'est pas les seuls, on a toujours mis l'accent sur une transition qui était équitable envers euh, tous les Québécois, les Canadiens, et mis l'accent sur le développement d'alternatives, notamment en matière d'électrification des transports, qui permettront à toutes ces personnes-là euh, éventuellement de de pouvoir faire une transition et d'être capable d'avoir des, des alternatives de transport qui ne passeront pas par les combustibles fossiles. Follow-up, Cormac? Sh sure. Um, I, I would love if uh, Ms. Siegel could also uh, weigh in on that first question, but uh, I'll ask the second question right now as well, just to wrap it all up. Um, uh, Mr. Turnbull, I think this is more for you about the reaction from the government on what you're pitching today um, and whether you've had any conversations with Minister Guibault and whether there's any, uh, you know, sort of inclination that uh, the government is willing to uh, adopt these measures. But uh, first, I'll let uh, Ms. Siegel uh, chat about the first question. Sure, happy to weigh in. So the cost of inaction is severely greater than any cost to Canadian 
than any cost that Canadians have experienced yet so far. Um, but over $5 trillion in insured and insurable losses over the past two years have hit Canadians from wildfires, floods, which means disruptions to lives, disruptions to their to their business. Um, so the cost of climate change is already very significant and Canadians are feeling it. Um, specifically about the cost at the pump, if, if I have my numbers correct, I believe the majority of that is from increased profits throughout the oil and gas value chain. Um, not from carbon pricing and pricing in the damages that oil and gas has on uh, Canada's economy and people's lives. Thanks. If I could jump in, Cormac, it's uh, Taylor Backrack from the NDP. Uh, I, I, we also need to look at what the alternative we're comparing it to is when we look at these policies. And the alternative we're comparing it to can't be no climate plan, the status quo. That's not a fair comparison. And so if there's an alternative plan for driving down emissions that others are proposing, I encourage them to bring it forward and we can analyze the price of that plan. Uh, and, and I think that uh, Julie makes an excellent point about oil and gas profit taking. When we see these soaring prices, a lot of the inflation of uh, oil and gas products that Canadians use can be attributed to the excess profits of the companies that produce those products. So that's why we've proposed that Canada follow the lead of the UK and implement an excess profit tax and drive the revenues from that tax back into affordability for average Canadians. Good comment. Um, to get back to uh, the, uh, the second question, I'll uh, just comment. So whether the government's supportive. Um, so since uh, last fall, when I hosted the Sustainable Finance uh, Forum on Parliament Hill, we've been having uh, conversations. We had um, uh, Minister Guibault Wilkinson, um, actually, I can't even recount the number of ministers. We basically could uh, have a cabinet meeting with the amount we had, uh, we had the Prime Minister show up and uh, show support, uh, obviously for the general topic and for moving forward. So I think there's a, an appetite for this uh, right now. I would say it is the logical next step, given what the government has done before and given the fact that we will not be able to meet our targets if we do not... Uh, align the financial system with our climate targets, with the Paris Agreement targets, with the science-based targets. And I think that that's important. Um, so I have in the last few weeks as well, since passing my motion, uh, been speaking with the Prime Minister's office, uh, Minister of Finance's office, uh, and several of the other ministers' offices. So we will be uh, moving this conversation forward, and uh, that's something I'm deeply committed to. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jeff Jones from the Globe and Mail on Zoom. Go ahead, Jeff. Well, thanks very much. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to ask a question. Uh, Mr. Turnbull, one of the key tenets of, um, of aligning the financial system uh, with climate targets is some kind of certainty. I think we've heard from, from the financial industry and uh, your government convened the Sustainable Finance Action Council to come up with a green taxonomy so there's some kind of guide and uh, to try and uh, weed out any type of greenwashing that uh, might be a risk there. But when they, do, when they delivered their first draft of the report um, earlier this year, your government has gone completely silent on it. Is there, is there specific flaws or is there a reason why um, uh, your government won't move forward with uh, uh, helping to push that taxonomy forward? Well, that's a very good uh, uh, question. It's an astute question because uh, our government did in fact form the Sustainable Finance Action Council, which was based on a series of reports that led to that formation, which I think was uh, really a, a good initiative. It's brought um, 25 of the largest financial institutions in the country to do foundational work on building the kind of underlying financial infrastructure for enabling the marketplace across Canada. 
uh, and they are aligned and have developed a green taxonomy uh, and produced a roadmap report. Uh, I believe um, our government uh, is committed to moving that forward and is looking at the best way to do so. So some of the work that I've been undertaking through my team and my office uh, is to consult with experts and figure out what the best possible sequence uh, of regulatory changes is and what the best legal entrenchment of the taxonomy uh, would be. Uh, I don't have an answer to that today. I'm looking at uh, all the different jurisdictions around the world and uh, trying to pull that information together so I can make recommendations uh, to the government. Thank you. Jeff, do you have a follow-up question? Well, just that, I mean, has there been any type of um, you know, friction from, say, the, the fundraising company or from, the, from environment and climate change to you know, I guess, I guess it was a bit of a surprise given all the work that went in that, that uh, the government you know, was so quiet. Um, Jeff, that's uh, uh, yeah. very garbled. Is there any way you can um, reposition yourself or speak a little clearer sorry. about the question? Okay. Yeah, sorry. Jim, he's yeah, muted yeah, up, so. We, that, you're all right, Jeff. They're better listeners yeah, than me. So I speak garble. Yeah. Um, thanks, Jeff. Great question. And uh, so basically, is there any friction? Um, uh, not that I am aware of. So um, all that I can say is that uh, I've heard nothing but support um, and uh, heard, you know, signs and signals of, um, you know, the appetite to move forward on the green taxonomy. I think it is essential. I mean, I think the, the fact that in 18 months, the 25 largest financial institutions in the country have come to consensus on, um, you know, essentially what is a series of definitions of what counts as green investments. Uh, I think there's questions to be answered around transition investments. Uh, and I think that we'll have to have uh, conversations about that. And I think that the taxonomy itself will have to be evergreen. Uh, kind of ironic that it's a green taxonomy and it has to be evergreen, but I guess uh, that just makes sense and sounds good. Um, but, uh, you know, it's going to have to be in constant development, and I think it's important that we have other stakeholders at the table. I know that uh, civil society organizations and climate scientists and Indigenous uh, communities need to be a part of that conversation. And so I look forward to um, the three-tier governance model that... Uh, that the Sustainable Finance Action Council has recommended uh, that, you know, I look forward to the development of that. And I think it'll be very important to have other seats at the table. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Turnbull. And next we have questions from Dominic Webb from Responsible Investor. Go ahead, Dominic. Good morning, can you hear me okay? Yep, go for it. Okay. Um so there's been a few references to initiatives in other jurisdictions, and I was wondering if you think there are any particular lessons that can be learned either from the EU, the UK, or further afield in terms of regulatory initiatives. I can answer that. So for sure, you know, we, we see that in UK, in e Europe, and um, uh, there have been already legislations um, concerning this alignment. Also, some banks, like for example, the um, Asian Development Ma Bank or the Inter-American Bank, they are also aligning their, uh, their cash flows with, uh, with Paris. Um, in, in Europe, we have the Green New Deal and the uh, Green Taxonomy, a really green Chinese ta taxonomy. Um, and, uh, and also, you know, in a different approach, the U.S. is with its two uh, big mammoth uh, uh, bills, the Infrastructure and Jobs Act and the Inflation Reduction Act, is also setting the, um, um, the path to aligning the, uh, their finances with, uh, with uh, clean technology and net zero 2050. I would just maybe add uh, the European Central Bank, uh, I think, has an expanded mandate uh, that we could look at following in terms of OSFI. There's been some calls, I think rightfully so, 
Um, I know it's come up in the green uh, finance study at the finance committee. I'm not a permanent member, but I've sat in on that study and um, looking at OSFI's mandate, which is narrowly um, defined right now and looking at the possibility of expanding that. Um, and I think that could follow from the European Central Bank example. Uh, there's also um, UK, in the UK the climate related disclosures, um, making those mandatory and having um, a phased in approach um, that I think will take a whole of economy approach, but phasing it in proportionally um, um, and looking at where climate risk and climate opportunity are most material. Uh, I think is uh, those are important examples, but there I think there are others, and I think we have to look at all of them and learn from our international partners. Thanks. I would add to that, if I may. Um, the UK and European Union have significant examples that we should be drawing from. Both jurisdictions have committed to mobilizing the financial system for their stated climate goals. Um, in the in the UK with a goal to have the first net zero financial system. I would say this mo this motion is kind of an equivalent Kickstarter in Canada showing a direction of travel. And then in the EU and UK, very specific policies that you know show success that should be should be pulled over here. Um, first of all about the, the taxonomy, thank you Jeff as well for that question, um, pointing in that direction. Um, the EU enshrined their taxonomy into law. That's essential for Canada to follow. Um, a voluntary taxonomy doesn't really doesn't really do much. Uh, Canada needs to define a truly green classification system, not including oil and gas, and then enshrine that into law so that financial institutions um, have to disclose how much uh, how much their activities align with the taxonomy, so Canadians can know if a product's truly green. The second would be looking to the UK, where they've uh, put into practice a transition plan task force, and I would relate this to OSFI. Um, which as part of its most recent regulation B15, um, you know, OSFI is moving in the direction of mandating climate transition plans. And I would say within OSFI's current mandate, hopefully this motion is demonstration that OSFI should be moving towards Paris aligned climate transition plans within their current mandate, um, following the leadership in the UK of a transition plan task force to make sure that financial institutions transition plans are truly Paris aligned and keep warming below 1.5. Can I throw one other example out? We don't have to look overseas. Quebec has better laws to make sure its pension investments are actually into the interest of Quebecers. We have no such restriction on the Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board decisions. They are uh, in a vacuum from concern about whether it's in the interest of Canadians as a, and the interest of Canada as a nation and in our public interest. En fait, c'est un, un très bon point. De façon plus générale, ça s'applique pour euh, les obligations fiduciaires en matière de climat. Ce qu'on a vu au Québec euh, à une certaine époque avec euh, la Caisse de dépôt, euh, c'est que euh, les intérêts financiers ne euh, sont pas toujours discordants avec l'intérêt collectif. Et quand il y a une convergence des deux, des deux types d'intérêts, il faut aller de l'avant. Et c'est exactement euh, plutôt ce matin ce qu'on a entendu. Euh, c'est ce que les analyses financières démontrent. Euh, Lorsqu'on a des marchés de transition, par exemple, le capital se fait très rare et ces marchés-là sont créés par de la réglementation. Il y a des opportunités de rendement qui sont très, très, très importantes. Et il faut inciter les marchés à les saisir. OK. Dominic, you have time for a quick follow-up. So go ahead if you have one. Thank you. I think one of the concerns that we've seen over UK and EU regulation has been negative lobbying by financial institutions and industry associations. Is that something that you are concerned about with um, CAFA? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think with any of these, uh, you know, important national issues and, and big next steps, there's going to be people with various views. Um, I, to date, have only had anything or I would say nothing but support. Uh, and in fact, I've been lobbied the exact opposite, which is that the financial institutions want us to move forward. They need the certainty and underpinning of credibility uh, to prevent against greenwashing. Um, and to assure Canadians that there's uh, credibility in the financial products that they develop. I think they want to uh, be a part of the solution. They want to fight climate change. They want to uh, 
um, recognize and realize the very real uh, enhanced returns for their uh, beneficiaries, uh, whether they be members of pension plans uh, or um, business owners um, or any other beneficiaries, uh, I think they really do legitimately want to uh, um, help. I think, you know, as we've heard today, there is some misalignment in terms of some of their behavior and activities, and I think that's part of this conversation. So I fully expect that we'll have a range of views, And uh, but no, I'm not concerned about uh, being lobbied on this. Uh, I'm uh, concerned about my kids and my grandkids having a future. And I think if we don't step up now uh, and bring our financial system into alignment, they won't have a future. Okay, that's it. Thank you so much. I appreciate you making time for the press gallery and its members. Merci à toutes et à tous. And we'll see you next time. Merci. Bye-bye.